Hi, my name's Ganesh Taylor. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the Francis Crick Institute, which means basically I study embryonic development and molecular biology. So I'm a scientist. Ganesh, thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about genome editing today, if that's okay. Um, tell us a little bit about it and where it, the sphere sits at the moment. Sure. So. Um, Genome editing is the, the newest name for a form of technology that's existed for some time. Namely, it's molecular systems that researchers use to change DNA. Um, the one that we've heard most about at the moment is CRISPR-Cas9. That's the one synonymous with that term. Um, and it's kind of like the iPhone to the mobile phones, right? So that technology has existed for a long time, um, but this one is far more powerful than um, any of the previous generations. And I think that's basically why this sort of concern or why the debate about it a lot at the moment because um, yeah with with increased power uh, of a tool comes increased numbers of things that we can achieve or do and that can be used both for good and bad as it were and so people are getting concerned or at least starting the debate and and that's an important thing to be doing actually well maybe we can go into those details in the debate let's start with what are some of the most important potential benefits of genome editing? So, um, in my opinion, and I'm a, I'm a researcher, so I'm biased, but um, I think the most important use of this technology actually is in the research field. So, um, this, this technology, this genome editing technology, represents um, a tool that makes people like me be able to do better experiments, to, to do cleaner experiments in terms of um, cleanly deleting pieces of DNA that we're interested in compared to other previous technologies. And that literally translates into better results, things that are more reliable, more reliable data. And so I think the most, um, the best application of this technology is in the research field. And that's basically where we're going to find the greatest gains. And in our lifetime, perhaps, what everyday changes might this make to normal people? I mean, I, I'm not a betting person. I was going to say I'm not a betting man. Um, so the honest answer is I don't know. Um, obviously, we've already had cases of um, patients um, with leukemia and such like that have um, been cured, as far as we know, using slightly different generations of genome editing technologies. So not CRISPR-Cas9, but of that sort of ilk. So clearly, at least in certain spheres of medicine, this might actually get some further traction. I think if I was to, to predict another field that would probably adopt this technology or would be maybe wise to, in my opinion, uh, would be agriculture and livestock. So that's one of the less contentious fields where you know, the application is both easy and effective and you know, the rewards are usually worth the risk. And yet there's contention around GMF. Do the potential benefits outweigh the risks? And are, is that contention perhaps unfounded? So full disclosure, I'm, that's not beyond my scope of actual expertise. My, my sense would be that, you know, if you take a measured scientific approach to these things, you don't tend to release these sorts of organisms into the wild without having done all the rigorous testing necessary prior to that point. So, my answer to you should be something along the lines of I trust my scientific colleagues to do their jobs appropriately and not to step outside the lines of what makes scientific sense um, is reproducible and then on top of that actually is deemed to be safe by the, and wanted by the public because of course all research and all findings and all innovation is held accountable by the public and by the legislation and the regulation that is created in, in light of what the public want. So what should the public be wary of with genome editing? I think they should be wary of um, too many partisan uh, opinions and um, scaremongering and also, yeah, it's not a silver bullet, they don't exist, so just keep, keep you cool, be rational about it and try and let, let people do what they're meant to do. And is, um, is the regulation in place to stop partisan application of this genome editing? That's a, that's a difficult question. Um, obviously, there is a lot of regulation already out there, actually. Um, but um, as we know from the case earlier on this year, Jiang Ku He in, uh, in Shenzhen in China 
It was the first case of somebody who did apply CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing technologies in the human context and actually did implant embryos that should never have been implanted really, at least by Western standards of, of morality and ethics, into a, into a woman and those babies apparently were brought to term. So, um, and that, that, that occurred in a, in, a, in a state where there was actually legislation or regulation and guidance at least um, already in place. So whilst it does exist and of course regulation is important, um, people do sometimes break, break the law and break the rules, don't they? Let's talk about your um, ethical perspectives. Is there a line, an ethical line to be drawn between gene editing for medical purposes and for enhancement purposes? So, I think it's, that's a sort of somewhat semantic debate, which is fair enough, absolutely. And uh, it comes down to what do you define as an enhancement? Um, my personal opinion is, uh, as we are now in this moment, we are already enhanced from what our biology deems us or the, the fate that our biology would have had for us, right? So any intervention is an enhancement in my book, and so therefore there's no line, really. So there's no distinction then between um, editing genes perhaps to remove um, a disease that's passed down through them, perhaps even a terminal disease, and editing genes to decide the colour of your children's hair or their eyes. I mean, so technically, if we're talking about the medical case that you're presenting, right, we're talking about single gene most likely, something that we assume or know uh, from years of research is going to give you disease X, Y, or Z, whatever it is, okay? Um, the application of this technology in that context is a lot easier to do, actually, because it's a single gene. The trait that you're describing, on the other hand, like, for example, eye colour or hair colour or, you know, the one that most people often bring up is intelligence, things like that, they're, they're polygenic, right? It means multiple genes are involved. And um, so the possibility of doing that, mod modifying those traits, is a lot harder to achieve on a practical sense, okay? So the honest answer to your question, is there no difference between doing this and doing that? Well, technically not really, but in terms of practically doing that, it's quite different. And on top of that, the most important thing to, to, to understand in this context is we know one gene causes a disease and therefore we remove it. The point about things like hair colour or eye colour is that they're often more sort of, they're about odds. If you carry certain variants, you are more likely to be of X or Y phenotype. You have blue eyes, you don't have blue eyes, whatever it is. Whereas on the other hand, we're talking about something where we have a certainty or relatively close to a certainty. If you have this gene mutation, you are going to have this disease. Um, and basically, I think my, my personal opinion comes down to the fact that I think, you know, we don't get a great deal of choice about our genes before we're born anyway. You don't get a choice if you're going to have this mutation that's going to give you an illness or a choice about what your eye colour is going to be because your parents basically, they reproduce and that's it. You get what you get given. So if my parents wanted to change that for me by conscious choice, I don't see why that's any different to them choosing where I'm going to grow up or what school I'm going to go to or how they're going to feed me or parent me. But that's quite a contentious point of view, I realise. Because them choosing what school you go to, what they feed you, those are situational factors linked to socioeconomics, their own circumstance. In the circumstance of them choosing your hair colour, um, is there not a, are they not taking away consent from yourself? Or in something perhaps more serious than hair colour, um, and they're not taking away consent from yourself, even though at that point you haven't yet been born. Um, I, I, I hear your point. Um, but again, I think my, my point stands. I never consented to any of the things that happened during that point in my life. Uh, equally, I don't consent to what school I go to or how I get fed. And arguably the food and the nutrition that I'm exposed to during my early years would have been extremely important to my future potential, actually. So I think, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think so, no. Yeah. Will genome editing be a privilege for the rich? I mean, that's, that's going to be determined by us, right? Completely determined. The, the technology itself, um, 
the actual molecular part of it is not that expensive. Checking that the edits that you wanted to induce in a genome have occurred, that, can, that is relatively expensive, but it's a lot cheaper now than it ever was before. So sequencing the entire genome is about what $1,000 at this stage or something like that. So the cost is coming down. So that's quite expensive. When we talk about, you know, doing genome editing in human beings, uh, we, we always, we don't say explicitly, but we're talking about a context where basically if I was to genetically modify my children, I would have to do that in an IVF setting. You can't just, you know, this stuff all early embryonic development happens usually inside a, a human's body. So um, the cost of IVF is something that you do need to factor into it. And that's actually an already existing social construct, right, where it is defined by money. If you have money, you can afford it. So um, if it was to come into the market now, it probably would be because it has to be put through an IVF sort of context. And that is, as I just said, already defined by money. Does it need to be that way? No, nothing has to be that way, but that is how it is currently. Should non-essential, i.e. genome editing, that, does, that isn't to prevent, as we said, something like um, uh, degenerative disease, should that be subsidised by a public health service? Absolutely not. No, 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 no not, not at all, no. So um, just to be very clear about this, I don't, I'm not condoning that everybody should get to pick the colour of their children's hair or at least even attempt to try and do that, okay? Because it, it would be an attempt. As I said, these things are polygenic. It's not going to be a case of certainty. Um, but my point is just people who have the means to choose what type of education they give to their children, it's no different really to sort of try and attempt to rig the system such that your children have whatever traits you think might be desirable. Um, medical interventions, on the other hand, are a slightly different ethical debate because if a child is born that has, um, carries certain genes that mean that they're going to be heavily reliant on a medical system that is, in this country, for example, publicly funded, that does become... Uh, a more public debate, one might say, or cause of um, debate. And do you have an answer to that debate? Um, I'm going to go with a cop-out line on that front, which is I have my personal opinion, but I can't speak for everybody else. And that's the point of democracy. And I, I strongly uh, value a democratic decision. And um, that's why debates and places like this are really important because it starts to inform people about how this technology works and starts getting people to think about what they make of this technology and what they value. And in the end, presumably, it would always come down to, hopefully, in the ideal democratic scenario, some sort of public discourse that shapes whether or not we do or don't require people to use genome editing under certain circumstances or allow it to certain people if they should choose to or absolutely prohibit it, you know. So you work in science communication as well. Are there any myths that you would like to break around genome editing? Or if not that, since we're giving you a platform, are there any other myths that you'd particularly like to break about the areas that you work in? Um, thank you very much for that opportunity. Um, I guess I've kind of already said it, which is just, I find it really interesting that people seem to think that, um, that there's a silver bullet, but there, there isn't. And the most important thing that I always find myself saying in these sorts of contexts is, um, yes, in theory, this technology could make us all smarter and more intelligent, in theory. But it's a really important thing to remember that we are only able to achieve anything based on the knowledge that we have, and we do not have the necessary and sufficient knowledge about these traits that we're so interested in yet to be able to use this technology to achieve it. Namely, in theory, yes, we could make people more intelligent, but we do not know all the genes involved or how they work or the interplay of those genes in actually creating superior or higher intelligence, for example. And so therefore, right now, absolutely not. We can't, we cannot achieve that just yet. So there's a big difference between in principle and yes, absolutely tomorrow, let's do it. Does that make sense? Yes. What excites you most right now about your areas of research? Well, yeah, I, I love my job. I, get, I, I have to say that right now. I love my job. Um, and actually mostly for, for something that we've already talked about, basically. I love the fact that I get to study something that is so contentious, mostly because I don't think it should be contentious, but I think it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. Um, 
And I personally, I see that as part of claiming back our respective identities. I think it's really important that, you know, it's really important that we study things like why, what, what is it to be a female? What are the, what are the biological characteristics associated with, with having two X chromosomes or an X and a Y chromosome? And, and how far does that extend? And what does that mean? And how does that impact what medicines we take or, or kind of things we should be doing or shouldn't be doing? Um, and I think having more information about that can only be a good thing. What has your experience as a woman in STEM been? Um, I'm a really bad person to ask that question to because I'm expected to toe the party line and I, ca I, can't, I can't do that. I've, I'm a scientist. It doesn't make a difference if I'm a female or a male as far as I'm concerned. I have never once been told I can't do something or achieve something because I'm a female and um, perhaps I'm lucky to have never been told something like that to my face or perhaps I'm ignorant to have not ever noticed it. I think life is hard enough as it is without having to start developing paranoias about whether or not I'm being excluded from something because I do or don't have the expertise or whether it's simply because I'm a female. What I will say, however, is um, I think greater than the issue of being a female in STEM uh, is a matter of money, actually. Um, and um, it takes a certain level of risk taking to be an academic. Um, especially financially speaking, actually. They don't pay very much. It's not a very constant, uh, stable stream of income or um, career to take on board. And so on the whole, it tends to be only people who can afford to take those kinds of financial risks that feel comfortable or don't notice the fact that that is the case you know, when it comes to academia. And um, so I guess that's the biggest concern that I've sort of had in my line of work. And, you know, you handle it. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.